a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce uh, my partner, Dr. Aaron Garvey, who's one of our pediatric surgery attendings here at Phoenix Children's. This is a really important discussion that applies to surgeons and non-surgeons. I have a lot of emotional thoughts about what Aaron's going to talk about. It's a lot of things have changed for the better, and um, Dr. Garvey is one of the reasons why things are changing for the better. Uh, but a little bit about Erin. So she's originally from Colorado, uh, where she was a student athlete at the University of Denver. And then she did her medical training at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. Then she came back to Arizona. She came to Arizona as a general surgery resident at the Mayo Clinic here in uh, Scottsdale. And she received multiple honors and first place awards for presentations. She's a wonderful speaker. She was an all around complete superstar. Um, and we got to meet her during her training when she rotated through Phoenix Children's and decided she wanted to pursue pediatric surgery. So we were lucky enough to recruit Erin as our first pediatric surgery fellow. And she weathered the ups and downs of, of, of having a new fellowship start and it, with its rapid changes and she came out on the end of two years, an excellent doctor, an excellent surgeon, and with just great judgment. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the Mayo Clinic, U of A College of Medicine, and Creighton, and is one of the founding members of the Women's Surgical Collaborative here at Phoenix Children's. Uh, she's recently turned her attention to um, matters of physician wellness, burnout mitigation, and also is very active in local and national efforts to increase diversity in surgery. She's a frequent academic collaborator with many people around the country and locally, and that's led to more than 30 publications already in a very short time. Um, importantly, Erin is a good friend, and she models uh, just a caring attitude and a lot of thoughtfulness, and it's very much appreciated uh, in our group. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Garvey, and um, you can direct your questions to the, Q the Q&A. We'll keep track of those questions throughout. There's also a CME code um, that's posted on the screen right now, and we'll repost that um, about halfway through as well. So, Erin, uh, please take it away. All right. Good morning. Like Dr. Van Leeuwen said, this topic is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm pleased to be speaking with you all today. Now, I do have some disclosures. Number one, I am a surgeon, and literally everything I learned about breastfeeding, I learned from Facebook. Now, please don't log off because of that, because I promise there is more to the story than that. And I guess I also just disclosed that I am a geriatric millennial with that Facebook mention, but never mind. Moving on to disclosure number two, I know that most of you are pediatricians, and I promised the pediatricians with whom I collaborated on all of these projects that I would not give a 45-minute lecture on the benefits of breastfeeding, as you are all already very well versed. So. Why is the surgeon giving grand rounds on lactation? So let me preface by saying that I'm gonna be weaving my story throughout the lecture today because our experiences shape our passions and help to influence our passion projects. So sometimes research is me-search. So I began delving into the lactation world when I was pregnant with my daughter pandemic pregnancy. She was born in August 2020. Do not recommend. But I knew breast milk with all of its immune system benefits would be important for her. So I began obtaining my Facebook degree from our local breastfeeding expert at Agave Pediatrics, Dr. Lori Jones, and her Facebook group for physician moms called Dr. Milk. And that stands for doctor mothers interested in learn in lactation knowledge. And this group has over 46,000 members and they all set me up for success from the get-go. Mackenzie and I were doing great with breastfeeding. And then just shy of her being three months old, I was back at work on a 30 hour call shift. Shout out to my former junior fellow, Dr. Al Hajat and his wife, who sent us this onesie that says, relax, my mommy is a surgeon. On that call night, 
I was like, relax, relax. I got this. I'm super doctor surgeon mom. I'm armed with the knowledge of 46,000 other super doctor moms who have done this before. I put my wearable breast pumps in my bra, press start, and wouldn't you know it, two minutes later, I get a level one trauma activation. Fast forward to two plus hours later, when the child is stabilized in the PICU, I realize that my breast pumps are still latched and they have been for the past two plus hours. Now the pump shuts off after 20 minutes or so, but you have to physically unlatch them. Thankfully, I didn't sustain any physical trauma myself and all of the children and myself managed to survive the night. A week later, I got all the way to the hospital only to realize that all of my pump supplies were still at my house. So back up the 51 at six o'clock in the morning, I went. And at this point I said to myself, huh, I think this is gonna be really hard. Thankfully, I had a village of super surgeon moms to share the heart. Dr. Sharon Nagy was our in-house expert, having had a baby and reached her pumping goals the year before us. This is Dr. Nagy, bottom left, in the shower room on the fourth floor in the women's locker room that the OR staff has turned into a lactation room since there is not one on the fourth floor. You can see she's got her giant bag, hydration cup, laptop balanced on her lap, and her prized milk. And I know I have personally pumped in this small shower room with at least two other OR nurses at the same time. In the middle here, you can see Dr. Erin Fawcett. She had her twins about three months before my baby was born. And Dr. Aditi Biscetti had her son a week before my baby. Thank goodness for these women and the support we gave each other. It was hard and it was early on, but we were making it work. As I began chatting more with non-attending colleagues about their babies and lactation, however, I started to see that not everyone was able to make it work. A resident rotating on our service said she didn't even try to breastfeed, knowing that she was coming to our busy surgery rotation for three months and that pumping while here at PCH would have been impossible. Both nurses and MAs told me they tried for a week or two to pump at work after returning from maternity leave, but they just didn't have the time or support and they lost their supply. And an administrative assistant shared with me when she asked for pumping information and accommodation, she was told by a supervisor to pump in the bathroom, which by no written policy or medical society guidelines anywhere is acceptable. Things then got harder for me too. I went from this, heading back to work from maternity leave to this in a few short months. This was taken in the same fourth floor locker room, shower, makeshift pumping room as Dr. Nagy's picture on a day when I no longer recognized myself. We were constantly sick. I spent a lot of time on my couch or horizontal on the floor with my baby when not at work. The skin under my eyes began sloughing off. And this wasn't a COVID warrior mask mark, and it certainly wasn't a bad reaction to a new eye cream because I definitely didn't have an eye cream routine back in those days. Now, I'm not saying that this is lactation-induced eye skin sloughing, and I must admit that at that time, I had several other medical problems going on that I would continue to ignore for another six to eight months. Bad doctor. But I think this sloughing represents that I was quite literally depleted in every sense of the word. Now, it wasn't all terrible. Here's a day that my hair is curled and my makeup is done and the black and white photos hide the eye sloughing so well. 
This photo was taken on a PTO week when Mackenzie was about 10 months of age, and I am forever grateful for these photos. After my PTO, I returned as our surgeon of the week. I saw Mackenzie awake twice that whole week for 10 minutes each time. And that was the last time she latched. Despite the tips and tricks from the 46,000 Facebook member support system, our nursing strike didn't end. That was the end of our breastfeeding journey. And I was not ready for that. So I did what any committed science supporting surgeon mother during a pandemic who was too depleted to acknowledge her own health concerns or any other alternatives would do. I started exclusively pumping. Dr. Nagy gave me her Spectra breast pump, which became a fixture on my desk, and my Spectra traveled in my car with me to the various hospitals around town that we cover. And as a research loving surgeon, I was also sending breast milk samples off for COVID antibody studies that were being done at the time. I turned our freezer into a milk repository, but did not buy an extra freezer just for breast milk storage, which is not that uncommon a thing to do. But then finally, at 16 months of age, my little baldy had her last bag of breast milk because on December 31st of 2021, I finally acknowledged that 2022 needed to be the year of my health and it was time to stop pumping. I know I promised I wouldn't belabor the benefits of breastfeeding, but for the baby, we're talking about decreased ear infections, decreased viral infections, less asthma, SIDS. There's some research on obesity and type two diabetes as well. For the mama, reduced risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, type two diabetes, hypertension and heart disease. And also importantly, for the employer, Breastfeeding can reduce parental absenteeism from work, medical costs for the employee and the infant, and decrease employee turnover, which can be very expensive. The American Academy of Pediatricians and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continuing for one to two years of life or longer as mutually desired. But the studies show the realities of breastfeeding are not as rosy. There are a handful of studies on residents and lactation. 85% of surgical residents have reported discomfort when having to ask to leave the OR to pump. The incidence of breastfeeding discrimination in one study was reported at 25 to 50%. 64% reported a diminished supply. 26% had clogged ducts, 16% experienced mastitis. I also do not recommend worst fevers of my life. And there was a higher incidence of postpartum depression. A 2020 study showed that 87% of residents intended to breastfeed for six months and 74% were able to but only 27% intended to breastfeed for a year and only 13% were able to. And it's always the same barrier cited. Inadequate time to pump with erratic and flexible schedules, inadequate space to pump, inadequate support, and vague or absent policies. So thinking about vague or absent policies as a barrier, I began to wonder what our lactation policy was here. I was able to find breast milk mentioned in the non-exempt employee's rest period policy. If an employee needs additional rest period time to express breast milk for her infant child, she should notify her supervisor and or human resources to determine an appropriate accommodation for such request. At least it wasn't completely absent, but it did seem a bit vague. So at this point, I began sending emails out to various people, lactation consultants, program directors, others who had had babies recently, and it was serendipity that the lactation 
consultant shared with me, oh, you should link up with Dr. Samater. She's working on this for trainees. So this was the beginning of this wonderful lactation working group, first with the five of us. Dr. Allie Thompson, who was the PEDS chief resident at the time, Dr. Christy Samador as the PEDS associate program director, Dr. Z Vasu Bafaraju from medical education, myself as a surgeon, Christina Bignoli from wellness and the entire PCH lactation team, only a few of which are pictured here. And then Dr. Anna Gary from hospital medicine joined us as well. Dr. Samater and her collaborators had already done the work of putting together a GME lactation policy draft, and I was able to review and contribute to it from a proceduralist perspective. It is a four page PDF document, and it was approved and put into place in the fall of 2022. You don't need to be able to read it all right now off this slide, but I would like to give you some highlights. The needs of individual mothers are variable between every two to four hours. On average, it takes 30 minutes every three hours to express milk, including transport to the room, pumping, cleaning and storing supplies, and storing the milk. Insufficient milk expression can lead to discomfort, leaking, clogged ducts, mastitis, again, I do not recommend, and a decrease in milk supply. So our policy outlines expectations for all of the key players, including the responsibilities of GME for having adequate time in private lactation rooms consistent with national recommendations and expert guidelines. The training program and program directors ensuring the trainee has a written plan in place and is able to be accommodated during conferences and patient care. The lactating trainees themselves rotation directors, attending supervisors, and even the trainees peers. Trainees have a written lactation accommodation plan tailored to their needs. They don't have to ask permission to go pump, but they also will not leave the bedside of an unstable patient or miss the critical portion of the OR procedure. So there is some balance there. And the trainees should feel comfortable contacting their program director if they face any obstacles. We want everyone to be familiar with this policy because awareness is going to contribute to creating a supportive environment and culture. This is an example of the accommodation plan. And like I mentioned before, the amount of time each person needs to sufficiently empty their breasts while pumping is variable. And this isn't something you know until after you've had your baby and you've started breastfeeding and pumping. So that can affect the timing of finalizing this accommodation plan. This is a poster from our work group that was presented at the Association of Pediatric Program Directors meeting this year about the baseline level of support our lactating trainees at Phoenix Children's were reporting before the implementation of our GME lactation policy. It was a small number of respondents, but still meaningful information. But 87% said their breastfeeding goals were negatively impacted by training. 87% had decreased milk supply and 42% experienced plug ducts. The responses further detailed the usual list of needed action items, needed for protected pumping time, better pumping spaces, improved faculty education and support because supervising attendings were the group identified as needing the most education on how to support trainees, whereas co-residents were deemed to already be supportive. In parallel to the formation of the lactation work group, a group of us early career female surgeons with the guidance of Dr. Kathy Van Leeuwen we're also founding the Women's Surgical Collaborative here at Phoenix Children. And with the departure of Drs. Nagy, Fawcett, and Buschetti, this group became my new source of female surgeon and surgeon mom support and camaraderie. In addition to supporting each other, we have also collaborated on some research projects. 
This was an oral presentation at the American College of Surgeons in 2022 and was published in the Annals of Surgery this year. Led by PI, Dr. Gwen Grimsby, this is the largest survey of its kind with over 4,500 female physicians looking at infertility and pregnancy complications in female physicians. Now, not surprisingly, we are older in age at time of first pregnancy at 31.8 years compared to 23.6 years in the general population. But we also have double the rates of miscarriage and preterm birth. We're more likely to seek infertility evaluation and treatments, which may be due to variables like knowledge, resources, and access, but regardless. These are data that we should be sharing with our young medical students and trainees. This abstract by our Pediatric Surgery Research Fellow, Dr. Brielle Ochoa and Dr. Grimsby will be presented at the Academic Surgical Congress this February. And it's another survey of nearly 3,000 female physicians, 528 of which were surgeons who responded to the question, is there a formal lactation policy at your institution? 43.4% were unsure, 34.8% said no, and 21.8% said yes. So while still in the minority, not an insignificant number of institutions have lactation policies. Also, also in parallel with the Lactation Work Group and the Women's Surgical Collaborative, Dr. Sarjita Shukla assembled the Division Wellbeing Directors. The Division Wellbeing Directors came from Dr. Shukla's role as Chair of the Medical Staff Provider Wellbeing Subcommittee, which was created in 2021 under the Professional Health Committee. The Division Wellbeing Directors was created in 2022 with the focus on well-being at the local division level. And there have been numerous well-being initiatives that have stemmed from this group. Dr. Samater is also a division well-being director, and together we decided that an idea we had been discussing in the lactation work group would be great to disseminate through the well-being directors. After a few back and forth trying to come up with a catchy name, we began formulating the Lactation Advocacy Champions, or LACS. So what is a lactation advocacy champion? It's someone who is knowledgeable and approachable source of support for lactation. At first, we intended LACS to be for the trainees to help roll out the new GME lactation policy, but we extend ourselves to all of the new parents who work at Phoenix Children's. The LACs are familiar with the GME lactation policy and can meet with the trainee to discuss their accommodation plan and also serve as a li liaison between the trainee and whoever, be it the program director, APD, a rotation coordinator, physician supervisors, other trainees, or other staff. We have a SharePoint folder with lactation resources galore so that LACs aren't having to constantly reinvent the wheel. They are able to direct people towards the lactation rooms and share our resources. There are currently 24 of 36 divisions represented. So if you see your division listed here and are interested in being your LAC, please email me because we still need cardiology, PICU, CT surgery, dermatology, endocrinology, forensics, genetics, nephrology, ophthalmology, pathology, psychiatry, and pulmonology. So I wanna give a Huge shout out to all of these super physicians and APPs serving as LACs. This is very much a grassroots effort, and we have feedback from several trainees that your presence and work substantially helped them in their breastfeeding goals. But we also have feedback from several trainees returning from parental leave who are unaware that we exist. So program directors and associate program directors, please take note and know that this support is out there for your returning trainees. And everyone in the audience, please take note that this support is out there and use this as a resource. In terms of where are the lactation rooms, 
there is a beautiful 23 page colorful PDF of the location of all the lactation rooms by floor, including description. Wellness is also planning on having permanent information booklets in each lactation room, helping to educate the house supervisors, HECs, those who use and maintain the spaces on the expectations of the rooms and tips as well. And not known by many, there is a larger four bay lactation room located inside the laboratory special testing near the radiology waiting room on the first floor of the hospital. Ideally, the lactation rooms are stocked with pumps because that is one less heavy thing that you have to schlep around all day. But we have come across problems hearing from trainees, employees, and even patients' parents that there are not pumps in the lactation spaces. Thank you so much to Christina Bignoli and Wellness for tracking down this information. But we are supposed to have 170 Medela hospital grade pumps in inventory, 97 of which can currently be located, and most of which are in the main tower. So while the search for the rest continues, Wellness has decided to put one of its four pumps in each of the following building's lactation rooms one in the East Building, one in the Conference Center, one in Rosenberg, and one in the Ambulatory Building. And this will be completed by the end of this month. So the Lactation Work Group, the Women's Surgical Collaborative, and the LACs have all provided input for how to improve upon our lactation rooms. This photo was taken by Dr. Allie Thompson as she went around inventorying the status of all the lactation rooms and while this one does have a chair and a pump and some nice artwork on the walls, it has also become a storage facility with three patient room tables, a large standing scale, and a neonatal scale, all crowding what is already a small space to begin with. And this was the norm on our lactation room photo finding mission. But today, I'm pleased to share, after beginning discussions on these improvements around this time last year, IT is now working on installing laptop and phone chargers and laptop table arms to the chairs. Hooks will be added to the back of the doors. Trash cans, disinfectant wipes, and paper towel dispensers will be provided and stocked. In-use placards will be visible. And new chairs will be put in the first floor or bay lactation area. Now, we are still working on the most coveted item of having fridges in the lactation spaces, but the barrier is how they will be maintained and checked. However, if we can overcome these barriers, Wellness has um, been willing to purchase them. For supplies, when you forget yours at home, the gift shop will once again be stocking Medela pumping kits, bottles, feeding tubes, milk bags, and nursing pads. And by the end of the year, there will be a lactation vending machine in the wellness center, which employees have 24 seven access to. And it will house a number of Amita and Medela pumping products for purchase. So kudos again to Christina Bignoli and Wellness for continuing to work so hard on all of these exciting changes. And we also greatly appreciate the help of IT and facilities as well. Now, our lactation consultants are also a fabulous resource. Although their priority, first and foremost, is to the patients of Phoenix children, they are also able and willing to help with the lactation needs of employees and even the spouses of employees. This is something I discovered after my breastfeeding journey, and it definitely could have saved me a handful of really awkward telehealth lactation visits during COVID had I known this. Phoenix Children's also offers semi-annual staff baby showers with giveaways and information about benefits and leave for new parents. This year, they will be held on Wednesday, March 13th from 9 to 11 a.m., and Wednesday, September 11th from 9 to 11 a.m. And you can sign up for this through LMS. A newer offering from Phoenix Children's is Mindful Return, which provides resources both for parents returning to the workforce and for managers to assist their employees in the return to work process. 
In 2024, Phoenix Children's will be sponsoring two parent workshops on February 13th and August 28th from noon to 1 p.m. and one manager workshop on May 29th from noon to 1. You can sign up for these via LMS as well. And Wellness will be raffling off 20 courses and 50 books for those who complete two of the following. Register for the baby shower, attend a mindful return workshop, and or complete the Cigna's Healthy Baby, Healthy Pregnancy, Healthy Baby program, which is a program through our insurance company that pays you in a gift card to have a few phone calls with a Cigna RN throughout your pregnancy. Any new parent can go to www.mindfulreturn.com and sign up for the four-week maternity leave course or the working dad's four-week course. Now there is a fee of $399, but per the prior slide, Wellness will be raffling off 20 of these courses. If you have any questions about any of the wellness offerings I've discussed, please don't hesitate to reach out to Christina Bignoli in Wellness. So these are just some of the wonderful things going on at Phoenix Children. But now I'd like to switch gears to share some interesting things in the lactation world going on outside of Phoenix. First, to circle back to the height of COVID times, I think we all remember how fast and furious, but yet not quite fast enough, papers were coming out about the characteristics of and findings relating to the virus. This was a prospective cohort study out of Israel that between December 23rd, 2020, when the vaccine was first available to January 15th, 2021, they enrolled 84 women with a mean age of 34 years with infants with a mean age of 10 months. These 84 women provided breast milk samples prior to vaccination and then weekly for six weeks beginning two weeks after the first dose of vaccine. And all participants received two doses of the Pfizer vaccine 21 days apart. They found that two weeks after the first dose of vaccine, 61.8% of breast milk samples tested positive for anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA antibodies, and that percentage increased to 86.1% one week after the second dose. As for IgG antibodies, they remained low until one week after the second dose of vaccine, at which time 91.7% of samples were positive for IgG antibodies, and this increased to 97% at weeks five and six. And no mother or infant experienced any serious adverse events during the study period. So eight weeks after their last day of enrollment on January 15th, 2021, that would have been March 12th, 2021, the time point at which they would have been collecting their last data point. And this paper was published online just a month later on April 12th, 2021. So thank you to the authors and the lactating women of this study for getting this information out there so expeditiously. And this wasn't the first study about antibodies in breast milk. This was published just a few months prior in February of 2021 and references back to the times in the pandemic when we just didn't know what to do. And we were separating newborns from their mothers with COVID in the delivery room and discouraging breastfeeding for them as well. This is a study of 18 women who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. Again, average age was around 34 years, and the average age of infants was around six to seven months. 37 breast milk samples were collected, and 15 women also provided 70 breast skin swabs. For the breast milk findings, they found no SARS-CoV-2 RNA within the milk, but they did find 76% of samples had IgA antibodies and 80% had IgG antibodies. But most importantly, this was the first study to report that 62% of their milk samples were able to neutralize a SARS-CoV-2 infection in vitro. As for the breast skin swabs, they did detect SARS-CoV-2 RNA in eight out of 70 samples, but they were unable to comment on whether or not the RNA represented viable virus. 
So the neutralizing finding of this study helped to strengthen the argument for continued breastfeeding for those dyads in which the mother had COVID-19. Now this is a study published a year later and was from the research group where I sent my breast milk at the Division of Infectious Diseases at the School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. This isn't the particular study that my milk was included in, but this was a prospective longitudinal study of 30 pregnant or lactating women, and they measured SARS-CoV-2 specific IgA and IgG antibodies, as well as neutralization capacity, pre-vaccination and at one, three, and six months post-vaccination. SARS-CoV-2 specific IgA antibodies were detected at one and three months post-vaccination, but they had waned by the six month time period. IgG specific antibodies peaked one month post-vaccination and persisted above pre-vaccination levels for at least the six months of the study period. And lastly, 83% of milk samples had SARS-CoV-2 neutralization activity one month after vaccination but this went to 25% of milk samples at the six month time period. Now I'd like to change gears again and start talking finances. So this study was published this year in the Journal of Perinatology about the direct marginal cost of breastfeeding. I think in medicine, we are used to hearing there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yet I have heard many times that breastfeeding is so great because it's free. So this study had a very conservative approach to their calculations of cost, but I think we can all agree there is nothing free about this. So for equipment, up to $445 for breath pumps, storage bags, and bottles. Although some pumps are covered by insurance, I think my wearable breath pumps alone cost around $400 out of pocket. $500 for extra maternal food, and this was based off the USDA low cost food plans and WIC packages. Vitamin D supplements, either for the baby or for the mom. And the working opportunity cost, which they use the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour in their calculations of three to four hours per day of breastfeeding. So summing all of that up gives an estimate of $8,600 to $11,600 in cost of breastfeeding for one year. A year of formula feeding costs between $800 to $2,500 from many sources. So I think this meme sums it up nicely. There is a lot that goes into being able to pump breast milk for your child while away from your child. And it ain't cheap and it certainly ain't free. Continuing on the lines of cost and opportunity cost, there are several institutions around the country that account for the time it takes for lactation and how that impacts one's productivity and compensation. The Ohio State policy has been in place for years and years and allows for 30 minutes of pumping time to be blocked per half day clinic with a corresponding decrease in the RVU target for the first year after delivery by 12.5%. Boston Medical College also has a 12.5% RVU target decrease for lactating physicians up to six months after returning from leave. UCSF also allows for blocking time in clinic and reimburses the block as a 99214 equivalent. And it's really important to remember that these templates need to be changed ASAP during pregnancy to allow for the block to truly be blocked time for pumping by the time the mother comes back from leave, depending on how far into the future your clinic calendars are open. So lastly, I wanted to share about the fourth trimester initiative which is a multi-center prospective randomized trial looking at return to work accommodations and the well-being of physicians and surgeon trainees who are birthing parents. This is led by Dr. Erica Rangel, a critical care surgeon at MGH with a passion and national reputation for maternal wellness, and with Dr. Tate Shanafel, a Stanford hematologist prolifically published in physician wellness also on the team. So the control group gets a Fitbit sleep tracker 
and $200 in Amazon gift cards for answering surveys. The intervention group also gets a Fitbit sleep tracker in addition to a hands-free portable Willow breast pump, a six-month lease of a snoo bath net, a faculty mentor to serve as a source of support, and 24-7 access to OBGYN care for questions and support. Enrolling began in the spring of this year with a goal of 152 participants. The participants are to wear their trackers whenever they are sleeping or napping and also fill out surveys on burnout, how work is impacting their personal relationships, fatigue, self-reported medical errors, career satisfaction, and mood. The study is based on the fundamental belief that a short-term investment in the well-being of physician trainee moms during a challenging life transition yields long-term benefits in professional satisfaction and physician well-being. And I would even propose career longevity as well. So these RVU changes and fourth trimester initiatives are coming down the pipeline. And I think they're gonna help a lot of people, mothers, babies, spouses, employers, and the physician mother's future patients too. I will conclude with another one of my favorite memes, also based on conservative estimates. Breastfeeding for one year is approximately 1,800 hours. A full-time job with three weeks vacation is 1,960 hours. If you think about this in the context of our trainees' 80-hour work weeks, or most all of our work weeks that are far over the traditional 40 hours, you can see how people would need extra support. So rather than trying to conduct formal quantitative interviews to try and publish our findings, I informally checked in with those trainees who have become parents over the past year since the lactation policy has been in place to try to get a sense of where we are at. It was again, a small cohort of residents, but I'm very grateful for their feedback and willingness to share. Some knew there was some sort of lactation plan, but didn't know the details or where to find it. Some had heard of and benefited from the lactation advocacy champions, and those who hadn't all said that would have been so helpful. And there were unfortunately still stories of not being able to meet breastfeeding goals due to supply, not being able to be sustained during long rounding days, or being able to meet breastfeeding goals but in a lonely, isolated way without any support. So I'm hopeful to continue to work on collaborations to provide that short-term investment in the well-being of all new mothers in the Phoenix Children's Family, from our patients to environmental services, to MAs, to PAs, to trainees, to the C-suite, and everywhere in between. I want to thank you on behalf of all of the babies and mothers everywhere, and my now three-year-old baby, for joining me this morning and listening to my talk. If this talk didn't resonate with you at all, because you were able to breeze through your breastfeeding journey, or your spouse didn't have any of these issues, or it's 2023 and you were perfectly fine formula feeding your child, or you had to for any one of the many medical or life reasons, let me assure you that any glimmer of acknowledgement or understanding or support to those who are in the thick of their second or third full-time job equivalent while breastfeeding and pumping for their child will be greatly appreciated and mean more than you could imagine. Thank you. I mean, Erin, that is absolutely unbelievable how much time it is clear that you put into this over the last few years and um just from my perspective just that championing this the repeated education at the hospital and all of the lacks are just to be commended i mean and i know it'll be ongoing in order for you to let people know that these things exist um there are several comments just uh, you know appreciating your work um and just the fact that you're championing this for people that have had some difficulties. Um, 
Dr. Perry, who's the division chief for nephrology, signed up to be your representative for nephrology. So I connected you two by email, but Thank you. Uh, she's, she's ready to go. Perfect, um, Dr. Perry. And, and lots of uh, lots of amazing comments. There's a question um, in the chat. So partner support is so important in meeting breastfeeding goals and the ACGME endorses six weeks of paid parental leave for both birthing and non-birthing parents which we rolled out for trainees. Do you know of any innovative ways healthcare systems are supporting employed partners of lactating moms? I hadn't come across anything in the literature, um, but when I surveyed our trainees, uh, a few of them were male who had become recent parents, the non-birthing parents. Um, and in response to my question of, do you know that PCH lactation will help your spouses, um, even though they don't work here, um, that, that is not well known. And that is a, I think, a fabulous resource that we have here that I had to clarify, I think, five or six times uh, when I found that information out because I was just so blown away by how amazing that is and how helpful that would be. Um, but I do think that focusing on the family as a unit, um, my goodness, I feel like the spouses of physicians need their own support system before they even become parents, let alone when they are parents as well. So I think this is a great um, avenue that we could do much better. Yeah, and just doing something beforehand. Um, another question, thank you for this fantastic talk. How much of this support, this support occurs automatically at our institution? Do you have to request accommodations individually um, or is there a way to activate everything all at once like the RVU target adjustments, time for pumping? Um, I think probably you're just on the beginning of a lot of those things, but. Yeah, we are very much in the infancy of this. And like I mentioned, the lax feels very grassroots right now. We are, I was just trying to disseminate people into the divisions because they know like who's pregnant in their in their groups and can reach out to people that way. But absolutely, my vision for this is that it is like a welcome package to PCH as part of your benefits. By the way, these are the lacks. This is how you get in touch with them. When the trainees get oriented, if you happen to have a baby while you're here, like there is this program in place, um, we really need to get the information out there more. And this is the grand rounds is honestly one of the first steps. Um, we have also been planning on advertising in the stat email newsletter. And I've been working with um, their department on crafting a intro um, just to get the word out more. But absolutely, I think it needs to be very well packaged and just streamlined. Um, in so turn, push go and just everything yeah, happens. Yeah, exactly. Because um, it honestly broke my heart when I got emails back from these new parents over the past year. It was like, no, I haven't heard of that. That's so cool. Uh, that would have been really helpful to have like a support mm -hmm. system to go to and know that I had it an advocate on my side. So uh, there's a question there's a question in the chat that kind of relates to these changes you've made and the fact that they didn't exist in the past. Um did the other surgeons in your support group who left it's it seems like all the initial surgeons in your support group who had babies have left. And there's a comment in the chat chat that is that true and does that seem like a loss? And I guess my question to piggyback on that is do you think if some of these policies had existed then that they would not have left? It was an immense loss to me um, because they were my immediate support system. Um, and I think being a surgeon mother is a very unique way to be a mother, um, especially we were all four of us just starting our careers, basically. Um, they, despite leaving, have continued to be instrumental in helping me um, grow this and think about ideas and participate. Um, I, I cannot retrospectively crystal ball um, whether this would have been helpful, um, but I'm certainly helpful that it helps in retention uh, going forward. Another question related to that. There are no men on your working group. My guess is that men are a possible source of lactation discrimination. Is there a role for male colleagues in supporting this effort? Yes. So in my initial call for lactation advocacy champions, 
um, through the well-being directors. So that's how we disseminated this was uh, each well-being director went back to their division and said, Dr. Garvey's coming up with some crazy lactation group who wants to be on it. Um, but my description and call email specifically said, you do not need to be or have been a lactating female to be a lactation advocacy champion. I did not receive any um, raised hands from male, but you are very, very welcome. It, whether you have had a lactating spouse or not, like absolutely, we need that uh, diversity and representation in this group and inclusivity to again just make it better. I think that would be uh, that would go a long way towards supporting students and residents, especially the proceduralists who are male, to say. I understand that you'll need to take a break. I welcome you to just go ahead. I mean, coming from your male surgeon, you know, train who's training you, I think that would just be a really good sign. Absolutely. So all right, all you men out there sign up with Dr. Garvey's uh, as, a, <laughs> as a lack. Um, another question, ultimately, ultimately, a lot of these changes will depend on buy-in from the leaders of our institution. Um, have they expressed interest in supporting these initiatives? Yes, I need to thank Dr. Dan Osley um, for all of his support, including with the founding of the Women's Surgical Collaborative. Um, he has been a champion for us, and I've had a few discussions with him about this topic, and he has um, stood behind me and, and helped me move things forward. So hopefully we can continue to to push that. Uh, my my dream is a PCH-wide policy for all employees. Well, and something that's scalable to other institutions, especially the institutions where your colleagues went or you know maybe some others through the ACGME. But this really, to me, seems like it could be a template for a lot of places. Um, there's an anonymous comment from a resident who recently had a baby, has been pumping nursing since she was born. Thanks so much for putting this talk together and organizing these resources and bringing awareness to the topic. So you definitely helped that particular resident. Um, another question, do these support efforts apply only to physicians or other PCH staff? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we decided to roll out the lactation advocacy champions. Like our original plan was we got to get this GME training policy uh, or GME lactation policy out to the trainees. So we decided there would be physician or APP champions for each division, but we quickly recognized that not every employee at PCH belongs to a division. Um, and then that's where we've been brainstorming, like how do we get this out to everyone? You know, as a pediatric surgeon, I know when our MAs or RNs are having babies and I can directly reach out to them that way. Uh, but there are many PCA or Phoenix Children's employees um, who won't be captured by the division structure. So we absolutely need to get this in under a bigger umbrella. That would make sense uh, for onboarding and orientation, but also those uh, the baby showers. I'm sure all this information is is given out during those baby shower events as well. It will be now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, I think that's it for questions. Again, Erin, I just want to thank you for doing all of this work. And I know that this work is going to expand to other areas that have to do with parenting over time at Phoenix Children's. And I'm really also grateful to Dr. Osley and Phoenix Children's leadership for trying to uh, set the tone nationally for how to take care of their employees and the residents and trainees that, that we can model this to them as well. And it's just been a pleasure to watch you grow and to watch you advocate for this. You're the perfect person to do it. And thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Um, as a reminder, you can um, sign up uh, for credit for this through the CME and the text you text uh, 45022 to the CME number. Um, everybody have a great rest of your day and a great holiday.